All right. Well, today we're talking about Our Lady and the reason why, because we've got her great feast day on the 15th, the Assumption. Um, and I'm going to be looking at one aspect, one of her titles, the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to go into some great detail here. It's quite exciting. I'm very excited about this talk as well, because you're going to see new insights to understand not only how Mary is the Ark of the Covenant, but why she is the Ark of the Covenant and continues to be the Ark of the Covenant even today, okay, in heaven itself. Now, when it comes to anything about Mary, sadly, Mary is one of the three great battlegrounds that divide Catholic Christians from non-Catholic Christians. Uh, well, there are many, many reasons why we have divisions among ourselves, but they're mostly related to the authority of the Pope, the Mass and the Eucharist, and the Virgin Mary. If you're going to speak about the Virgin Mary in a Catholic sense to any non-Catholic audience, you're always going to get a little bit of heated discussion. People will get a hot under the collar to some extent or another. Mainly it's because Catholics are seen to exaggerate Mary. When we read about Mary in the, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, we read about a young, humble village girl who's called and chosen to be the mother of Jesus. And all Christians are willing to accept that. It's just that Catholics are accused of going well beyond the Mary in the Bible and adding titles and honours and privileges and dogmatic definitions that exalt her more than, more than the biblical Mary we read about. That's the accusation. Let's deal with that accusation in the course of this presentation and see whether it's justified or not. Now, I remember my own experience. Um, I grew up, I was born in a Maronite family, went to church from time to time, you know, found the Aussie church a bit boring when I was really young as a six and seven year old. You know, we used to go to St. Jerome's at Punchbowl. And, uh, and I remember the day when my mum and dad told me, we're no longer going to St. Jerome's, we're going to go to the new church, which was just across the road from where I lived, which was St. Charbel's at Punchbowl. That was 1973, you know, and I was really excited. But after a while, I still found church pretty boring. And I was in and out and just really mediocre, so to speak. But in 1979, I had a big conversion experience when I went to the Billy Graham crusade. If you don't know who Billy Graham is, he's one of the greatest American preachers in Protestant history. One of the greatest Protestant preachers, I should say. I think his background is a bit Baptist, a bit Presbyterian in American history. He probably traveled more than any other layman in, in the history of the world throughout the 20th century. He's in his 90s now, he's still alive. And I went to hear him preach at Randwick Race Course there in May 1979. And at that point, at that moment, Christianity became far more important for me. Jesus Christ became far more important for me. Going to mass regularly became far more important. Now, the person who invited me to go to Billy Graham was a friend of mine named Stephen, who was a Baptist. Now, he didn't intend me to continue to go to the Catholic Church. Okay? He intended me to eventually become Baptist to join his church, the Punchbowl Baptist Church there in Arthur Street, Punchbowl. But I wasn't, a, I didn't have the courage to leave the Catholic Church because my dad was going to wallop me if I did. Because my dad's experience was that one of his youngest brothers sadly became a Jehovah's Witness in the mid 60s. He's still alive and he's still a Jehovah's Witness. So, well, back to the original point Christianity is a lot more important for me at the age of 15. And I then began to attend. I, with my friend Stephen, the Interschool Christian Fellowship meetings there at lunch times once a week at Punchbowl Boys. And I remember this very, very well to this day. It sticks in my mind very clearly. There was one lunchtime session. I'm a year 11 student and I'm flicking through the Bible. <coughs> you know, it's just my mind drifted and I wasn't focusing on the talk that lunchtime and I'm just flicking through the Bible. It was a 1974 Good News for Modern Man translation and I come up to that point in the Gospel of Matthew that talks about the brothers and sisters of Jesus and specifically mentions them. James, Joseph, Judas, Simon and his sisters. When I read that and read that in English, like I freaked. 
I, I, it really hit me and I, I broke out in a, like a cold sweat. What's this? Now, I know through one of my other Lebanese Maronite friends that, you know, Mary is said to be a virgin and stayed a virgin all her life and never had any other children besides Jesus. Well, that's what the Catholic Church taught. So what, what, what am I reading here in the Bible? How can the Catholic Church answer this? The Catholic Church appears to be clearly wrong. And so I left, I was walking out of that lunchtime session scared. But as I was walking out, it got worse because there was another young guy there who was probably a year younger than me. I don't know who he is, what his name was, but he was talking to one of the teachers and I, his name was Mr. Batten. He was a maths teacher. Now there was about four or five staff who came to these inter-school Christian fellowship meetings each week. And I remember Mr. Batten very well. He was also my basketball coach. Uh, from time to time and he was talking to this young fellow and he was saying look you know when it comes to Catholics I don't know why they go you know they give her all these different titles we we respect Mary the Mary in the Bible but to call Mary Queen of Heaven is far exaggerated there are other holy women she's no greater than any of the other holy women of the Old Testament so as I heard this walking out this was a double blow and it, it, I felt this terrible gut feeling. And my, the, my response was totally illogical. I mean, I was only 16 years of age at the time. I was, I, had, I was pretty clueless. I was still looking for answers. I was becoming more and more confused as my Baptist friend was challenging me on all these other doctrines about the Pope and the Mass and infant baptism, etc. I left with this horrible gut feeling and my response was to stop praying the Hail Mary. I was praying five prayers a day, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, a couple of other prayers. And one of them was, the, I said, okay, I won't say the Hail Mary. And I stopped saying the Hail Mary for six years. Okay. It was a, just because of this experience. Now, so back to the original point. Does the Catholic Church heap upon Mary too many titles, too many privileges, too many dogmas and exaggerate and create a, a, a type of Mary who's almost a goddess? And do we engage in Mariolatry or the worship of Mary equal to or above Jesus, equal to or above God? Okay. Back on Ark of the Covenant, is this title justified? Well, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Many Protestant Christians certainly are very hostile to the idea of calling Mary the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because there is a biblical Ark of the Covenant that we read about in the Old Testament. <coughs> okay? In fact, I'll go into this a bit more detail later on. It was the most sacred relic, the most sacred box that the Jews, the Hebrews and the Jews carried around with them wherever they went. From, their journey, from their, their journey in Sinai, when they entered the Holy Land, when they kept it at a place called Beth El, or Shiloh actually, it's Shiloh originally, then when they moved it to Jerusalem, then when they placed it in the, in the Holy of Holies, in the Ark of the Covenant, and then God himself enthroned himself upon the Ark. Yeah, that is the Ark of the Covenant everyone accepts. Well, why is Mary the Ark of the Covenant then? What we have to understand here is something called typology. Now, there are different senses in which we understand the scriptures. When we open a Bible and we read it, the normal thing to do is to, to gain the literal understanding of scripture. Okay? For example, Moses led the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. What's the literal understanding? There was this guy named Moses. He was the leader. He led two million Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt through Sinai, 40 years walking around Sinai, and eventually under the leadership of Joshua, those people enter the Holy Land. That's the literal, historical, plain understanding of Scripture. But there are also spiritual understandings, spiritual senses of Scripture, which, if we need to, go beyond the literal build on the literal. And one of those spiritual understandings is allegory and type, typology. So with typology, what we do, what we are doing 
Typology is important because it connects the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And it makes the Old Testament intensely relevant still for Christians. When we look at the Ark of the Covenant, we have a classical type, anti-type scenario within typology. The type is the original. That is the Ark of the Covenant. What comes first in time? What we read about in the Old Testament, that box I spoke about that was so sacred to the Hebrews and the Jews. That's the type. The anti-type, however, that's anti-A-N-T-I, the anti-type is the greater reality that comes afterwards that we, really, that we usually read about in the New Testament. So we've got type that comes first in time. That is real, but in a spiritually, it's a shadow. It's a shadow that points to a greater reality in the future. That greater reality is the anti-type. Now with typology, the type and the anti-type are like and unlike at the same time. So we expect to find when we're comparing the type with the anti-type similarities, but also differences. Now, I'm glad we've got some strong light here tonight. And I'll give you an example of how something can be like and unlike at the same time. You see my hand here? There's my hand. Five fingers, palm, wrist, forearm, right up to my shoulder. It's got colour, it's got dimension, it's got flesh, it's got blood, it's got bones. What am I casting behind it? A shadow. You see? If you can see the shadow, it's like my arm. It's also got fingers, palm, wrist, elbow, and leading up to my shoulder. It's like my real arm. But at the same time, it's unlike. It doesn't have colour, it doesn't have dimension, it doesn't have flesh, blood or bones. It, in fact, it has nothing. It's actually an absence of light. So here is an analogy to help understand type and anti-type. They're like and unlike at the same time. And this is what we need to understand about the Ark of the Covenant that we read about in the Old Testament and that we, have dis we can discover in the New Testament. Now, I've already mentioned about one of the benefits of typology in that it, may, it connects the Old and New Testament or helps to connect the two. There's other things that help connect the Old and the New Testament. Prophecy is another one. Okay, all the prophecies relating to the coming of the Messiah, over 300 of them. Okay, we know that Matthew, in his Gospel alone, seeks to garner 60 prophecies from the Old Testament and show how they are fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what he does in his Gospel. Okay? Now, there were heresies that were floating around in the early church. And one of them, which was centred around Rome, was the heresy of Marcion, who denied the value of the Old Testament, said the Old Testament is the holy book only for the Jews. And the God of the Jews was the God of law and justice and punishment. But that God is not the same God as the God of the Christians, who is the God of grace and gentleness and love, etc. He went extreme there. And Marcion denied the Old Testament. But Marcion was combated in his ideas by one of the great early apologists, St. Justin, who went out of his way in his writings, both in his writings to the Roman emperors and his, and his, his famous dialogue with Trypho the Jew, went through the whole Old Testament to give us one type after another, one shadow after another in the Old Testament, Figures like Joshua or Moses and plenty more, the high priest, and show how they were types of the greater reality that is Jesus Christ. Now, what are some other types relating to Mary specifically that we discover that in addition to the Ark of the Covenant as a type? The tree of life in the book of Genesis, chapter 322. The tree of life gave us the holy fruit of life, okay? The fruit of the tree of life, eating that fruit would ensure that we would never die, 
okay? It, it preserved us in the gift of immortality. Now, that's a type of Mary, because Mary, as a tree, so to speak, gives us another fruit, and that's Jesus Christ, okay, who gives us eternal life as well. Another type is the burning bush. We read about this in Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Now, here we have, okay, Moses before the burning bush. The bush is burning, okay, it's a theophany. It's a particular manifestation of God to us. But the, the bush is not being consumed by the flames. In the same way, how is this a type of Mary? Coming forth from Mary was also the word of God. You see, from the, from the burning bush, you heard the voice of God. You heard the word of God. And the bush wasn't consumed by the flames. Coming forth from Mary is also the word of God, Jesus Christ in, in the flesh. And the word of God coming forth from Mary does not consume her virginity. Okay, so we can see there's an analogy there. There are likenesses and, and similarities, but differences at the same time. Elijah's little cloud in 1 Kings 18.41. Now, Israel was suffering a terrible drought for three and a half years. And after defeating the priests of Baal, Elijah was commanded to go up Mount Carmel, climb it, and come down seven times. And on the seventh occasion, when he's up on the top of the mountain, he sees a little cloud. He looks to the west, across to the Mediterranean, and he sees this little cloud It's in the shape of a foot. And as it comes closer and closer, it eventually covers the whole sky and it pours rain on thirsty Israel. It ended the drought of three and a half years. This cloud is also a type of Mary. How? Because Mary carries and brings to Israel the life-giving waters of Christ. She, the cloud bore within it water, which ended Israel's drought, spiritual drought. Mary brings, carries to Israel Jesus Christ, who ends our spiritual drought. The Holy of Holies that we read about in 1 Kings 6, that's the most sacred room within the temple. We're going to look at this in more detail later on. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, both in the days of the tabernacle, that mobile tent, when the Hebrews were traveling through Sinai, and then later on in the days of the temple, the permanent construction in Jerusalem, built in the days of Solomon. In the Holy of Holies, there's the Ark. You can only imagine it because you weren't allowed to go there. Only the high priest once a year could enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and do the relevant sacrifices. <clears throat> Enthroned on top of the ark, as I said earlier, the ark on the top had a, what was called a mercy seat. There were two statues of cherubim, their angels facing inwards. What were they facing, these statues? God himself, who was enthroned on top of the ark. Another form of theophany, cloud by day, fire by night. So here we have God himself dwelling within the Holy of Holies. Well, Mary's a type. As, that's the type. The antitype of that again is Mary because Mary's womb was a new Holy of Holies because in her womb was also God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who took flesh and is dwelling within her. OK, Ezekiel's Eastern Gate. We read about this in Ezekiel 44 two. Once the Lord God had entered in by this gate, it was shut and no man afterwards could pass through it. How does this represent Mary? OK, imagine this. You've got this enclosed garden and there's this eastern gate. and The Lord enters through the eastern gate. And once the Lord enters in through the gate, no one else is allowed through that gate. Well, that's the type. And how is Mary the antitype? Because when the Lord, that is the Holy Spirit, entered in through her to conceive Jesus Christ within her womb, no other man could enter through that gate. OK, it points to and we read this in St. Jerome. We, we read about this in the writings of St. Augustine. No other man could enter into Mary. It points to her perpetual virginity. 
Now let's now focus on the Ark of the Covenant specifically here. Probably the most famous type of Mary, it should be, not as well known as it should be. Let's look at the type, the original, the literal type that we read about in the Old Testament. Well, the ark was made of acacia wood. That's very precious wood. And it was covered completely in gold. The box itself, the lid on top of the box, were all enveloped in gold. Inside the ark, well, what did it carry? An ark carries something. This sacred box carried the most sacred relics of ancient Israel. An original copy of the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments inscribed on them. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you find that the very first set of tablets was actually were broken by Moses in fury when he saw the Hebrews worshipping the golden calf. He smashed the, those original tablets and he went further. He ground them to powder and he made the Hebrews drink, the, drink water with that powder in his fury when he saw how they had apostatized into idolatry, worshipping the golden calf, he forced them to drink the water with that grounded powder. But then afterwards they made another set of stone tablets with the Ten Commandments engraved. That second set is what was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. In addition to that was Aaron's priestly rod. In addition to that was a bowl containing manna from heaven. These were the three items. We read about this in, in Hebrews chapter 9 in the New Testament. Describes in that detail what was contained in the ark. Now keep, let's repeat this because these three items are themselves types. The Ten Commandments represents law. The priestly rod represents the priesthood. The manna from heaven represents bread from heaven. And they all point to something greater in the New Testament as well. Now, I've already said that on top of the ark was the mercy seat. And God himself was enthroned upon that. So the ark was, had, did two things at the same time. It carried sacred items and it was a, a throne. God's own throne on earth. Now, this is what you have to know about God. How personal God wants to be with us. Even in the Old Testament. Okay? You normally think about the old God in the Old Testament as being a bit more distant and hard than the, you know, what is revealed to us by Christ in the New Testament. But God is God. And even the God that we read about in the Old Testament is the same loving father as the New Testament, wanted to be intimately among his people. And this is how he did it, by resting, being enthroned upon the ark in the Holy of Holies. Now, the, ordinarily, ordinarily the ark is housed in the, ark of, in the Holy of Holies. You couldn't just walk in. Only one person a year could see the ark and be in the presence of the ark. And I've already mentioned that was the high priest. On the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Yom Kippur, when he made the sacrifices and atonement for the sins of, of worshipping the golden calf, when he sacrificed the scapegoat, the bull and the lamb in the presence of Yahweh. It was the only time the name of Yahweh was pronounced pub by, any, by any faithful Hebrew or Jew, by the high priest in the presence of this, what was called the Shekinah Karbite. I should have mentioned that earlier. This glory presence of God, that word glory comes from the Hebrew Karbot, the Shekinah Karbot, that's the presence of the glory. That's the presence of God, cloud by day, fire by night, there enthroned upon the ark. No one was allowed to touch the ark. Anyone who touched the ark just dropped it on the spot. And that's what happened to the poor fellow named Uzzah. King David saw it. King David was shocked. Actually, King David was angry that this poor man Uzzah 
when the ark was being carried on a carriage and the wheel of the carriage hit a stone along the road and, and it tipped over the carriage and the ark was falling to the ground. And this poor fellow Uzzah just innocently, with all good intention, just held, tried to hold up the ark, he died. Because only those with consecrated hands, that is those of the priesthood, could touch the ark. And ordinarily the ark was carried by four priests, each holding one end of two sticks, which were put through two sets of rings on either side of the ark to carry it around. And all this was to tell us something about not only how sacred the ark is in itself, but how, how more sacred is the antitype that the type represents that's to come in the future. The Jews often took the ark with them into battle and they felt great confidence when they had the presence of the ark among them because they felt they had God himself. It was a sign of God's presence with them. But you, be you can become superstitious here. You can become presumptuous. You can think that, oh, the, the, the Lord is with us because the ark is with us, that guarantees us victory. Well, that's not always going to be the case. And in one terrible battle, the, the Jews lost 30,000 killed. This is in the time of Eli. And 30,000 killed for the, a small nation in one day was a calamity. And not only was that a calamity, but the Philistines took the ark, they captured it as a battle trophy, took it with them and put it into their own temple. Now they're going to suffer consequences as a result. But that, when Eli heard about that, he dropped dead. It was a disaster for Israel, both in the numbers of men that they lost and in losing this most sacred relic. It's presumption. You can't go into, it's the same for us, don't think just because you're carrying a rosary or wearing a brown scapula, you're guaranteed you know, heaven, you've got to be faithful. You, you've got to be observant of, you know, the teachings of Christ, the church, the Ten Commandments, etc. All right. Now let's look now at the typology, beginning to look at the various aspects of the typology between the Ark of the Old Testament and the Ark of the New Testament, Mary. And where we can start is with a comparison between what we read in the second book of Samuel, chapter 6, and the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1. Now, when I go through this, you've got to keep in mind, don't fall into the mistake of thinking that the comparisons have to be exact all the time in every way. I once read some literature produced by a fundamentalist-type church in Epping saying, how Mary can't be the Ark of the Covenant because she's in these ways different to the Ark of the Covenant we read about in the Old Testament. Well, that's not how typology works. I deliberately emphasised earlier and will say it again now, with typology, the type and the antitype are the same and different at the same time. So in 2 Samuel 6 verse 9, we have David saying this, How can the Ark of the Lord come to me? This is after it been, uh, it's returning from the Philistines. The Philistines had it. God hit them with various plagues one after the other until they got so terrified they decided to abandon the ark. And then the ark is coming back. That's on the carriage. We have the accident with Uzzah, as I mentioned. David's terrified. They send it to someone else's home. Obedidom, the house of Obedidom, and it stays there for three months. Then when the ark leaves the house of Obedidom and comes to Jerusalem, David says, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? We read in Luke 1 verse 43, <coughs> Elizabeth saying about Mary, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So, Elizabeth here, this is Saint Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist, is saying something very similar to what David said about the ark. Elizabeth is saying very similar words about Mary, the new ark. Then in 2 Samuel 6 verse 10, we have 
the house, the, the ark remaining in the house of Obadidom the Gittite for three months. Mary stays with St. Elizabeth in, her, in the house of Zechariah for three months. Okay, why is Mary gone? Why is Our Lady gone to visit St. Elizabeth? To help her. St. Elizabeth is six months in advance of Mary in pregnancy. So Mary's gone there to help her for three months. So the, the new ark is in someone else's house, like the old ark was, for three months. And that's what we read about in 2 Samuel 6, 12. And the comparison is Luke 1, 56. In 2 Samuel 6, verse 15, we have this quote. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of horn. So when the ark is arriving in Jerusalem, there's joy, there's celebrating, celebration, there's shouting, etc. In Luke 1, verse 42, Quote, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So that when the ark comes to Jerusalem, there's great joy and exclamation. When the new ark comes to St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth exclaims with great joy, etc. As the ark is coming into Jerusalem, we read in 2 Samuel 6, verse 16, King David is leaping and dancing with joy before the Lord. In fact, he gets heavily criticised by his wife for this. His wife was Michal, the daughter of Saul, the previous king. You read David's answer. It's very blunt. I quite like it, actually. He says, look, you can say what you want, Okay. Because she was saying, How, you dance like an idiot. You're a king and you're dancing like an idiot. Uh, it was inappropriate the way you were dancing, you know, in front of the ark, in front of everybody. And David said, you can say what you want. I was doing it for the Lord. Just put her straight in. Well, I don't recommend that as the normal behaviour for a married couple. But she was bad spirited in her criticism. And David <laughs> just put it straight to her. You can say what you want. You can think what you want. But I was doing this for the Lord. Luke 1 verse 41, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see there again, joy at the arrival of the ark celebrated by David and joy in the heart of St. Elizabeth when the ark comes to her house and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the child as well in her womb leaps for joy. What's some other similarities here that are very important? between the first, the Old Testament Ark and the New Testament Ark. Remember, with the Old Testament Ark, as I've said very clearly already, God dwelt cloud by day, fire by night above the Ark. God overshadowed the Ark. If you look at a Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Greek word is episkiazane, okay, overshadowed. We have the same word in Greek in the Gospel of St. Luke for how, that, that's the word episkiazane, for how the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary at the conception of Jesus in her womb. Let's read it, Luke 1.39. The power of the Most High shall overshadow you. The Greek verb, the Greek verb is episkiazane. The same word that we read in the Greek translation of Numbers 9, 15. Now, I've already mentioned to you what was contained in the ark. What were they again? The second copy of the Ten Commandments, priestly rod of Aaron, and the manna. I've also mentioned that the ark was covered in pure gold, made of the finest wood, no one was allowed to touch it. No one was allowed to look into it. Okay. What do these, what do we, what do these facts tell us about Mary as well? They all point to the four defined dogmas. The four dogmas the church has defined concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let's look at them one by one. Okay. Two tablets of the law. 
the bowl of the manna from heaven, Aaron's priestly rod, they all point to the dogma of Mary as mother of God. How? Because these three objects all are symbols of Christ. The law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus is the new Moses and the perfect lawgiver. Aaron's priestly rod. Jesus is the one eternal high priest who offers himself on the cross as the Lamb of God. Christ is both priest and victim. The bowl of manna, the bread from heaven. Jesus is the new manna, the new bread from heaven, the Eucharist. So these three items symbolize a greater reality. They are types, but they symbolize, point to a greater antitype. And of course, the greater antitype is Jesus himself. Now, Jesus himself, these three great relics are contained within the ark. The greater antitype is contained in the new covenant. So the new ark of the covenant. That's Mary. So Jesus within Mary, well, we know Jesus, we take for granted here, of course, is a divine person, second person, blessed Trinity, true God and true man. He, he is God within the womb of Mary. Mary as an ark is carrying within her womb, not relics that point to something, but the actual greater reality, God himself. The acacia wood and gold covering, the best quality wood and pure gold. In the Holy of Holies, the room there in the midst of the temple, the walls were all covered in gold. Even the nails were made of gold. The ark is covered in gold. It symbolizes purity and perfection. The fact that the ark is made of the best wood and covered in pure gold point to Mary being incorrupt or uncorrupted by sin, untouched by sin, sinless. It points to her immaculate conception. It's a sign of it. See, gold doesn't corrupt. It doesn't rust, for example. Okay. It symbolizes that perfection, that perpetual perfection. I've already intimated to you about how Mary can't, sorry, the ark could not be touched. The ark could not be looked into. That points to Mary's perpetual virginity. Likewise, Mary could not be touched, was not touched, in inverted commas, by any other man, by any normal man. She was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and in that sense became the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Now, her marriage with St. With St. Joseph was a true marriage. It just didn't move towards that point of consummation, that sexual union that's normal for any marriage. Okay? What about, what dogma haven't I mentioned here yet? Is the dogma of the assumption. How does the ark point to the assumption of Mary. It points to Mary, mother of God, Mary who's immaculately conceived, Mary who's perpetual virgin. How does it point to Mary and her assumption? Well, we'll come to that later because there's a lot to say about that. All right. Now, remember with typology, the type and the anti-type are like and unlike at the same time. Let's look at the... Let's focus on how the Mary and the ark are unlike, but in these differences, how Mary is, as the New Testament ark of the covenant, is superior to the Old Testament ark of the covenant. Now, I've already said, the Old Testament ark was adorned, covered in gold, but Mary is greater because she's adorned with grace, sanctifying grace. Okay, and whatever we might think of gold and silver, especially now with the price of gold, whatever we might think of gold and silver and how precious gems could be, they compare nothing to in relation to sanctifying grace. In fact, sanctifying grace, I've read this in one theologian, this might sound dramatic, but for God to place one soul one human soul 
to fill it with sanctifying grace is a greater act on his part than creating the entire universe in the first place. The reason why is because in creating the natural universe, as marvellous as it is, as an act of infinite power, bringing into existence creation out of nothing, placing a soul, filling it with sanctifying grace, is raising one level of creation to a higher level of creation, to participate in the supernatural life. In, the, in a, crea a created participation in God's own divine life is greater than creating creation in the first place. Now, an ark, as precious as it was, I say it was because it's gone, as sacred as it is, it's still just a box made of wood and gold. While Mary, as a human being, a rational creature, full of grace, is far superior than any box, no matter how precious or sacred or consecrated it is. And as I said earlier, the Ark of the Old Testament carried symbols of Christ, but Mary is much greater because she carried Christ himself. Let's look back now again at the Old Testament Ark and understand how significant it was even more so, even more deeply for the Jews. And this will help us to understand what we need to look forward to with respect to the coming of Jesus, Mary, the New Testament, and now in heaven. With the, um, okay, let's go back to the beginning. When, the, when Solomon builds a temple, it's a project that took seven years. In fact, thanks to the Lebanese that it happened, okay? Without the Lebanese there, the, the temple couldn't have been built because um, uh, Solomon had a, an alliance with Hiram of Tyre, okay? In a Tyre in Lebanon to supply uh, architects because they had the brains, okay? And to bring the cedar wood from Lebanon across to the coast and ship it down and bring it into Israel. Without the Lebanese and their help, no temple, no house of God. Okay? Makes us feel a bit proud. <laughs> All right. Now, seven years to build it. Actually, I have read, you can still see some of the tracks and trails that were used to transport the cedar wood down from the mountains to the coast in Lebanon. Now, I haven't seen them myself, but I've read that you still can see them. Interesting fact. On the day of the dedication of the temple, the ark is brought into the Holy of Holies. And when you read it there in the book of, uh, I think it's Chronicles, I can't, just off the top of my head, the reference is gone. But the Lord God, Yahweh, just descends from heaven as a fire and fills the, uh, fills the temple, the Holy of Holies, and rests upon the ark. Okay, that's when it all begins. Now, let's move ahead hundreds of years later. So in the days of Solomon, that's somewhere in the 10th century BC. Let's move now three to four hundred years in the future. And we're entering a period of great crisis for Israel and Judah. Israel is the northern kingdom, 10 tribes. Sadly, after Solomon's time, because of his sins, it brings division. The northern kingdom splits from the south. Ten tribes go with the north. Two tribes remain in the south. The southern kingdom just has the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes form Israel in the north. Jerusalem, the temple, the ark are in Judah. In 722, the Assyrian kingdom comes a ruthless, brutal people like the Nazis of the Old Testament, and they destroy the northern kingdom and enslave the ten tribes and, take and, and transport them to another part of their kingdom. And they've been dispersed ever since. And they brought pagans to live in Samaria. They transported other pagan peoples and brought them into Samaria. And they become the hated Samaritans of the New Testament that we read about in the New Testament. A mixture of Jewish pagan beliefs and practices, which is why they are despised. So, a few a hundred odd years later, Judah is in trouble. 
This time it's the Babylonians. The Babylonians arose, destroyed Assyria from within. Colossal time in human history. Transition from one kingdom to the next. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon are all struggling for control in this part of the world. The Egyptians try to move in to fill in the power vacuum left by the, de by the devastation of Assyria by the Babylonians. And the good king of Israel, Josiah, goes to meet the Egyptians at the place called Megiddo. This is 606 BC. He's killed. That's the famous, that's the name that forms the famous word Armageddon, the final battle in the book of the Apocalypse. Josiah is killed. What does all this mean? Josiah was the biggest supporter of the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is preaching to, to restore Judah to fidelity to Yahweh. Because Josiah's predecessor, Manasseh, was a king for over 50 years and he was a disaster. He engaged in Baal worship, child sacrifice. He sacrificed his own son. He, he allowed all sorts of false pagan deities to be erected in Judah and worshipped. It was a calamitous time. Josiah is killed. Jeremiah is preaching. The only way to survive the coming destruction, the coming wrath, is to return back to Yahweh. And he's preaching that if you don't, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The Babylonians are going to come and they're going to destroy Jerusalem and they're going to destroy the temple. This is what he says, quote, Jeremiah 7, 4. Trust not to empty words crying the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God. The Jews were superstitious again. They thought they could never be destroyed by the Babylonians or anybody because they've got Jerusalem, they've got the temple, they've got the ark. And Yahweh's there, dwelling above the ark, among his people. There's no way they could be destroyed. But Jeremiah is saying, no, 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 no. If you remain unfaithful, all will be taken away. Yahweh will depart. You will be destroyed. Now, this is why Jeremiah was so hated. It's like a Catholic going around today saying, listen, the Vatican's going to be destroyed. St. Peter's is going to be demolished. The Pope's going to be killed. There's going to be no Pope to succeed him. And Catholics will say, well, what about Christ's promise that the gates of hell will not prevail? So if a Catholic is saying to me all this dire warnings about Rome, I wouldn't listen to him. And many were not listening to Jeremiah either because they thought he was speaking blasphemy. And many wanted him arrested and put to death. About the ark itself, <coughs> Jeremiah prophesied the following. Jeremiah 3.16. Men will no longer say the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. It will no longer come to anyone's mind. No one will any longer think of it or miss it, nor will it be replaced by a new one. So he's warning, you're going to lose the Ark. It's going to disappear and never be replaced. When did all these dire predictions come true? August the 10th, 586 BC. What happened earlier, 10 years earlier, the Babylonians descended, took thousands of Jews prisoner and exiled them to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was, you know, imposed certain restrictions on them, made Judah a vassal state. You have to pay every year a certain tax, protection money, we might call it, you know, and we won't conquer you outright. One of those people that were taken to Jerusalem in 597 was a fellow named Ezekiel. And he's now there for over 10 years in Babylon. Anyway, eventually the Jews become restive and they ignore Jeremiah's warnings. Jeremiah is saying, don't go into revolt against the Babylonians or you'll be destroyed. Eventually, well, they don't listen to him. One of the kings, while Jeremiah's uh, was presented to Jeremiah, his prophecy in writing, and that is being read, he's just stripping it strip by strip and putting it in the fire. Totally ignored what Jeremiah had to say. He, the, the, the king, the Jewish king, is more intent on forming alliances to fight off Babylon. And in one of his alliances, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Egypt. Egypt will support us against Babylon. And Jeremiah is saying, don't go with the crocodile. He calls Egypt the crocodile. They'll betray you. They won't even turn up. 
Anyway, Judah goes into revolt against Babylon. The Egyptians don't turn up. As Jeremiah predicted, Babylon descends upon Jerusalem on this fatal day, August the 10th. The temple is burnt to the ground. The ark is gone missing. We don't know what happens to it. Some private prophecy tells us Jeremiah hid it in a cave in Mount Nebo to be lost forever. Some others say the Babylonians took it, stripped it of its gold and then dumped it. But it's been lost. It's been lost ever since. And even more so, devastating. And Ezekiel sees this far away in Babylon. He saw the glory, the Shekinah Kabod, the glory presence of God, of Yahweh, Arise from above the ark, leave the Holy of Holies, leave the temple, go to Mount Olivet and ascend back into heaven for Mount Olivet. This is what you call the Ichabod. Kabod is the glory, Ichabod is the opposite. It's the departure of the Lord. The Lord has departed from his people. He's abandoned them because they abandoned him. He gave them many warnings, many prophets, and they still wouldn't listen. And the consequences were devastating. To give you that quote from Ezekiel 11.23, And the glory of the Lord rose above the centre of the city and paused upon the hill that lies to the east of the city. And that's, we know that to be Mount Olivet. The disaster upon Israel is just, we couldn't imagine what it was like. The, the Babylonians took 90,000 slaves and transported them to Babylon. M many, many more were killed. Some escaped down the Nile, down to Egypt, down to the Nile and settled around Ethiopia, thereabouts. Jeremiah survived. The Babylonians don't touch him. They actually like him because he actually preached not to resist and fight the Babylonians. So, Babylonian, so, so Jeremiah survives, but eventually he's killed by his own people. What's happened now is that you've got two prophets. You've got Ezekiel and you've got another one who arises in Babylon called Daniel. They're, they have to keep the morale of this people alive. The attachment of the Jews to the Holy Land, Jerusalem and the Temple, was enormous. And this has all been uprooted. It, it's just... They've lost it all. What does it mean? What's the future for the, the Jews in Babylon? Well, these prophets, they are keeping the hope alive. They are saying that one day you will return back to Jerusalem. The temple will be rebuilt. The glory will return. Okay. And, but when would that be? All up from about the year 586 to 538, the Jews are... in. Uh, captives in Babylon. One night, the Babylonians are just overthrown in an instant. The Persians and the Medes attack and just overthrow the Babylons, uh, Babylonians and a new empire is established, the Persian Empire under Cyrus. And Cyrus, by comparison to the Assyrian and Babylonian rulers, was very, very intelligent, very wise, very broad-minded, and he allowed the Jews to return back to Jerusalem, which they did in dribs and drabs. In fact, he released many of the captive peoples who had been enslaved by the Assyrians and Babylonians. And the Jews are coming back to Jerusalem slowly over time. Not all in one hit, but over years, bit by bit. And they find Jerusalem devastated overgrown, wild animals everywhere, the temple destroyed. So they set about to rebuild the temple. But this is not, these Jews, relatively speaking, are smaller in number and impoverished compared to the glory days of Solomon and afterwards. So the temple that's been rebuilt is insignificant, lacking the glory of Solomon's temple. We read in the book of the prophet Haggai 2.3. This is, there were men who were exiled to Babylon as boys. 60, 70 years later, they come back to Jerusalem. They're old men. They can remember the former temple in its glory. And they're seeing the new one being built. The new one being built is, relatively speaking, pathetic. And this is what they, they're quoted as saying. 
Who is there yet among you who saw this house in its former glory? And how are you looking upon it now? Is it a non-entity in your eyes? Okay. So the new temple that's being built, you know, it's just it's not up to it's not up to standard to what it was before. But it gets worse than that. Because remember, what was the glory? What was the heart of the original temple of Solomon? The Holy of Holies, the Ark, the presence of Yahweh, the high priest going in there once a year. Well, this new temple has no Ark because it's been lost and destroyed. And there's no presence of Yahweh enthroned above the Ark and the Holy of Holies. The temple, and we call it the temple of Zerubbabel, the second temple. The Holy of Holies is empty. But will it stay empty forever? This is the point. And we get the, some of the latter prophets pointing to a glorious future when the glory and the ark will return to the second temple. The prophet Haggai again. This is chapter 2, 6 to 9. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this present house will be greater than that of the former, said the Lord of hosts. You see what we're saying here now? This is God consoling them. Don't look at the glory of this building by comparing the ornaments or the stones or the curtains or the gold or whatever. Sure, the second temple is a non-entity, so to speak, in comparison to the original structure. But I promise you, says the Lord, speaking through the prophet Haggai, that the, the glory of the Lord will return to this house and will be greater than the original glory. Prophet Isaiah says something similar. We read it, Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verse 3. In the desert, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Let every valley be filled. Every mountain shall be made low. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh together shall see it. Some of you would have heard of that. Okay, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. What's this pointing to? How is this relevant to the New Testament? How is this relevant to Jesus, to Mary? St. Mark, when he sits down to begin writing his gospel, starts with this prophecy of Isaiah. He takes the words of Isaiah, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, who's preparing the way of the Lord? St. Mark identifies him as St. John the Baptist, who comes as the forerunner to Jesus of Nazareth to prepare the way for Jesus. Now, this glory that John the Baptist is preparing the way for is not a cloud. It's not in the form of a cloud, not appearing in the form of a cloud or the form of fire, but it's going to appear in the form of human flesh. And St. John starts his gospel by telling us that. In the beginning was the word. This is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then we go to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word there is tabernacled in the same way that Yahweh was in the tabernacle in the Old Testament days during the traversing through Sinai. And then John says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. There's that word glory again. Now, when we talk about glory, we think about sporting glory, political glory, whatever glory. But glory was a word that was directly referenced to God. Carbot, the second of carbot, the second of glory. This new glory that is coming to dwell among God's people. This is the glory of the second temple and the glory that's come not just for the Jews, but for all people. Here we have the second temple now. First temple is the temple of Solomon. Second temple is the temple of Zerubbabel. Then we have Herod the Great. Now Herod the Great is an Edomaean. He's next door neighbor to the Jews. He's not a Jew. 
He's Edomain. The Edomains are descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, going back to the early patriarchs. Now, Herod the Great, he's a great builder and he wants to ornament and he, re he wants to do up the temple and he does a great job. Okay, but what's the problem still with the temple? Despite all the renovations and the extensions and the ornamentations done by Herod the Great, the, the Holy of Holies is still empty. There's no ark and there's no glory <coughs> presence. What about all these prophecies I referred to? Haggai and Isaiah. When are they going to come true? Well, if you believe in those prophecies, you'll be waiting for them to come true. And normally when you think of prophecy, you would probably think, well, when the prophecies are fulfilled, there's going to be fireworks. But really, most of the time, Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled very quietly and virtually unnoticed. I read this wonderful book written in the 1950s by a Dr. Heinisch, a German, called Christ in Prophecy. It's an old book, but it's a great book. And it opened my eyes about Old Testament prophecy. Don't expect Old Testament prophecy, the fulfillment of such, to be always obvious. It's very subtle and mostly unseen. So if you're waiting for the glory to return to the second temple, like it, like it came to the first temple, it just wasn't going to happen. So how was, how did the glory come to the second temple? Well, I can tell you where and when. There's this girl in Nazareth, who conceives by the Holy Spirit and gives birth to this baby in Jerusalem. You know all about it. The baby is called Jesus. And that baby is an, seen by the world as a normal Jewish baby. So Mary and Joseph, seen by the world as the apparent parents of this child, have to, as good Jews, have to fulfill all the prescriptions of the Mosaic law. So, firstly, at eight days, Jesus is circumcised. At 40 days, Jesus has to be presented in the temple, like any normal baby. If Jesus doesn't go through these, he wouldn't be considered a Jew. Mary wouldn't be ritually purified. they will be outcasts in the eyes of the Jewish people. Jesus couldn't be accepted as the Messiah unless he himself went through these rituals, etc., so uh, when Jesus is 40 days old, here we have a scene, like an, an, a normal scene that would have happened many times every day, every week, every month, every year for a thousand plus years. You have a good, happy, proud young couple bringing their baby to the temple. Mary and Joseph carrying their baby to present him at the age of 40 days. And there's two people waiting two old people. One is Simeon and the other is Anna, daughter of Phanuel. And they're waiting for someone to come because they were told privately by God to wait because one day the Messiah is coming, he's coming soon, he's going to be presented in the temple. Simeon's given a specific promise. He would not die until he laid eyes upon the Messiah of the Lord. And there they're waiting and there they, they spot this child come in. And we know the rest. Simeon takes the child and says, Now, Lord, you can dismiss thy servant according to your promise in peace, because my eyes have seen the glory, the salvation, etc. And then he gives warnings to Mary and Joseph. You see this child? He's destined for the fall and the rise of many in Israel, a sign destined to be rejected. And a sword shall pierce your heart as well, so that the secret thoughts of many may be revealed. It's that day... The rest of the world didn't notice, but Anna, daughter of Phanuel, and Simeon are the only two who notice. This is how these prophecies of centuries age are fulfilled. When Jesus comes to be presented in the temple, he is carried in his mother's arms. Here we have it, the antitype. Mary is bringing, as the ark is carrying enthroned in her arms the glory of the second temple. The glory is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. The glory is now coming to his temple, is filling the house of God. 
when Jesus is brought to the second temple to be presented, that is when the glory has come to claim his house. And how does the glory come? Enthroned. The glory, remember, was carried in the ark of Mary's womb and now is enthroned in Mary's arms. And so that, this is how those prophecies are fulfilled. And again, we see Jesus coming to the temple again and again. The glory comes to the temple. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem, what does he do as an adult beginning his public preaching in Jerusalem? And St. John's Gospel places it at the beginning of his public life. He goes into the temple and in a rage he throws out all those who are selling things and ripping off people in the temple and overturns it, throws down all their merchandise. And he says, don't you know that my, that the, my father's house will be known as a house of prayer and you've made it into a den of thieves? His father's house, it's his house. That's why he's come to cleanse it because he had a right to. The, the Jewish authority said, by what right do you have to do this? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus called himself the temple. Jesus is the glory of the temple and he is the new temple because the temple is a type, a shadow of the greater antitype, Jesus himself. Jesus, by the way, is all those things. He is the glory of the temple. He is the high priest who sacrifices in the temple. He is the sacrifice himself as the Lamb of God, all wrapped up into the one person of himself. Now, so we see that, yes, we have an Ark of the Covenant for the Old Testament temple, for the temple of Solomon. Mary is an antitype, a greater reality, and she's the Ark of of the second temple, but it doesn't end there. The reason why, we look at the book of Revelation. We could look at chapter 11, verse 19. Here St. John has something revealed to him and he puts it down in writing as follows. Then God's temple in heaven was open. He, he, God's temple in heaven. Now I've been speaking about a temple on earth. Solomon's temple, it's Robert temple, but there's another temple God's temple in heaven is opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. So St. John sees a vision of God's temple in heaven and in God's temple in heaven, he sees the ark of his covenant. So we have the imagery of the temple and the ark appearing again, this time in heaven. Well, what's this all about? What ark are we talking about that John sees in the heavenly temple? Well, it's not the ark that was in the original temple in the Old Testament because that was taken by the Babylonians and destroyed. So John has seen a new ark in the midst of the heavenly temple. Now, again, we should focus here very clearly. We should get our minds around this clearly. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Tells us that the, the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament times, God commanded that they be made. He spoke to Moses. He commanded... Moses, that the tabernacle be shaped in a certain way, be constructed in a certain manner. Moses was obliged to construct the tabernacle specifically according to the instructions given to him by Yahweh. He couldn't deviate from them. Basically, to keep it simple, there was a sanctuary that was fenced off from all the tribes, from all the peoples. The Levites were the tribe that could reside closest to the sanctuary because they are the priestly tribe and they were broken up into four different clans. The rest of the tribes had to be encamped some distance away. There was, so you had this area marked off by, say, a six-foot fence. Inside that area were the, was the holies. Then you have marked off again within the holies, the holy of holies. And then 
Within the Holy of Holies, as I said before, the ark was placed. And God enthroned himself upon the ark within the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was fenced off from the sanctuary by a very thick curtain. And only that high priest could pierce that curtain once a year to do the sacrifices after he had a ceremonial bath, wearing a white garment, had a rope tied around his ankle, because if he dropped dead in the presence of Yahweh, he had to be pulled out, but no one else was allowed to be in there, only the high priest. So that's why he had a rope around his ankle in case he dropped dead in the ark to pull him out within the sorry, Holy of Holies. Why was this constructed in this manner? The book of Hebrews says, 8.5, was a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, God gave these specific instructions that the tabernacle was to be constructed in this manner because it was meant to reflect the heavenly temple, the heavenly sanctuary, where God dwelt in his full glory, enthroned in his full glory in heaven. And so when we move from the days of the tabernacle to the days of the temple, the, the, the model of the temple had to reflect the model of the tabernacle because that model was reflecting the heavenly reality. So let's understand this. The earthly tabernacle and temple had the glory, God enthroned, above an ark, and you had a high priest going there offering sacrifice. That was established on earth, but was meant to reflect the greater reality in heaven. How is the greater reality in heaven now complete? If we had those things in the earthly tabernacle and temple, we have to have those the greater reality in the heavenly temple. Okay, well, let's look at the heavenly temple. And let's make the type and anti-type analogy again. In the tabernacle and temple, we had God enthroned in his glory. Well, in the heavenly temple, we obviously have God enthroned in his glory. We had the high priest going in to do the sacrifices, piercing through the veil to get into the Holy of Holies. Well, where do we find that with the heavenly temple? Ah, it's Jesus Christ himself, because Jesus is the one eternal high priest. Now, what was his sacrifice? Himself as the Lamb of God on Mount Calvary. When Jesus dies on the cross, we know he descends and preaches to the souls in prison. We read that in 1 Peter 3. He rises from the dead after three days. Then he spends another 40 days on earth to finalise the building of his church, to equip the church with everything they need to continue his work of teaching, sanctifying and governing. What happens after 40 days? Jesus ascends back into heaven. Where does Jesus ascend from? Mount Mount what? Mount Olivet. Now, remember what I said about Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw the glory of the first temple ascend back into heaven from what mountain? Mount Olivet. Jesus is the glory of the second temple. He's the glory in human flesh. He ascends into heaven, back into heaven from what mountain? Mount Olivet. Okay. We see it there. It's so clear. Jesus ascends back into heaven. When he ascends back into heaven, he takes all the souls of the just that were in Abraham's bosom, from Adam and Eve onwards, all the souls of the just and the repentant sinners. He goes into heaven. None of the good people could enter heaven before Jesus. Because it's Jesus himself who opens heaven. It's his sacrifice that was on our behalf that pleased the Father, that opens heaven. But as the high priest was the only one who could go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, it's Jesus, the one eternal high priest, who's the first to enter through piercing the locked gates of the Holy of Holies of heaven. But when he pierces, he becomes the first of many and he opens the gates 
for everyone else to enter into the heavenly temple. What is Jesus doing now in the heavenly temple? He is still priest. He's still the one eternal high priest. He's not just up there in heaven sitting down as we heard in the debate with Tim Staples. If you could remember the debate, Pastor Barnes said that Jesus ascends into heaven and is seated and sits down and, and the work is complete at the right hand of the Father. The work is not complete. It's complete here on earth in time. But it continues in a sacramental manner at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is still priest, one eternal high priest, offering sacrifice on behalf of humanity before the Father. Is he offering a new sacrifice? No. Is he offering another sacrifice? No. What is he offering? Still the same sacrifice that he offered on Mount Calvary. How do we know that? Let's look here. Hebrews 6.20. Christ is a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. So Jesus doesn't stop being priest. He is still priest now in heaven. Hebrews 8.2. Christ is ministering in the true tabernacle. So Christ, the priest, is still ministering in the tabernacle of heaven. What is a priest who's ministering still doing? Hebrews 12, 24, quote, Jesus is our spokesman with his blood, which has better things to say than Abel's had. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he retained within his body the five wounds of his crucifixion. Jesus is there now, seated at the right hand of the Father, still as priest, offering to the Father his wounds, ministering, spokesman with his blood, which has better things to say than Abel's blood. Abel's, Abel was the righteous man killed by his brother Cain. His, the blood of Abel spoke to God, asking for vengeance, for the, his unjust killing. Christ's blood is greater than Abel's and speaks greater things than Abel's on our behalf. Revelation 5, 6, quote, Amid the four figures and elders, a lamb standing upright, yet slain as I thought in sacrifice. Who's this lamb that is appearing? It's slain, but is still standing. That's a contradiction. How can it be slain and still standing? A lamb that's slain and still standing? If it's slain, it should be dead on the ground. Who is this lamb? Jesus. Slain? Yes, on the cross. But standing, he is alive, risen from the dead, but still priest and lamb in heaven. So Christ is the new temple. Christ is the new high priest. Christ is the new glory. Christ is the one eternal high priest of the heavenly tabernacle of the heavenly temple. God as Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is the glory. Christ is the priest and the sacrifice. But Christ is not the ark. We have to complete the analogy here. If the tabernacle and the temple on earth had a glory, had a, had a priest, had an ark, and we know that heaven's got a glory and has got a priest, well, where's the ark of heaven today? Well, St. John saw it. I mentioned it earlier. Chapter 11, Revelations. He saw into the midst of the heavenly tabernacle and there he saw the ark of the Lord. But then in chapter 12, what happens? Suddenly, St. John sees this great woman clothed with the sun, with a crown of 12 stars, with the moon under her feet, now, you have to understand, when John wrote the book of Revelation, when he recorded the Revelations, he didn't actually record them in chapter and, with chapter and verse divisions. He just recorded it as a continued, con continued narrative. We have the ark of the Lord appearing in chapter 11, and then suddenly we have this great woman appearing. They're the one and the same. When John sees the ark of the heavenly temple, he sees the type, but then he sees the anti-type. It's fully revealed in this person of the woman. Who's this woman? 
with this woman is going to give birth to a child who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Who's that child? Jesus. So who's the woman? Mary. What do these symbols mean, by the way? Clothed with the sun. That's her virtues. Full of grace. With the moon under her feet. Crushing sin. The moon represents sin. It's under her feet. It's defeated. There's no sin in this woman who's full of grace. It's her immaculate conception. Gives birth to a child who's to rule the nations. That's Jesus, true God and true man, mother of God. Crown of 12 stars. She's a queen, queen of heaven, but queen of the people of God because the number 12 represents the people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, the 12 stars on her head represent her crown as queen of heaven and earth. So, the picture is being complete here. We, let's go back to Ezekiel to get the full picture now. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. Quote, and, from, and above the firmament, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness as it were of a human form. So above everybody is a throne and enthroned on that is a person in human form. St. John sees the same throne in man in Revelation 4.2. Quote, At once I was in the spirit and lo, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. This throne with the one seated upon it is above the angels, above the cherubim. But the ark in Revelation 11 is below the cherubim. Therefore, it is another throne for another ruler. The throne above the cherubim is the throne of the one eternal high priest, Christ. The other throne below the cherubim is the woman clothed with the, clothed with the sun and crowned with the 12 stars. And this woman is the Ark of the Heavenly Temple, and she is the Virgin Mary. And this is why the Assumption takes place. I haven't referred to the Assumption yet. I spoke about the Ark and how it's a type of Mary and reflects the dogmas of Mary, but I never spoke about the Assumption yet. So here it all comes together. We believe in the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, body and soul into heavenly glory. We're going to celebrate that next week. And that's her reward for her fidelity to her great vocation. And also she's assumed body and soul because of, of appropriateness. It's not appropriate that her body, which was that temple or that ark, that not only carried Christ, but gave to the word of God, that human flesh which would redeem humanity. It was inappropriate that that flesh would be subject to the punishment of sin, that is death, and be corrupted. It was appropriate that it would marry in response to her, for her fulfillment of her vocation, so generously would be rewarded in advance that reward which all humans who are faithful to Christ will receive one day. Resurrection, glorified body and enter heaven, body and soul. But there's another dimension to why the assumption takes place. To complete the heavenly temple. So that the heavenly temple would have its glory, the Trinity, have its one eternal high priest, Christ, and have, the, and have its Ark of the Covenant, Mary enthroned there in heaven as well. So the assumption completes that. Remember, the, the one eternal high priest enters the heavenly temple on Ascension Thursday. And likewise, Mary is, go, goes up into heaven, but assumed, taken up by God, probably 15 years later or thereabouts, to complete the imagery of to complete what is necessary for the heavenly temple. To conclude now, all this gives emphasis to the importance of Mary. 
In no way do we say that she is central. No, she is not central. For it is Jesus Christ who is the glory. Christ is central. But Mary is essential in his plan. And tell you another reason why Mary is essential. It wasn't sufficient that Jesus come into the world in human flesh just out of nowhere. If Jesus came into the world in human flesh, just popped into the world in human flesh and died on the cross and offered that to the Father, that would not have benefited us. Why? Because Jesus had to be one of us. He had to belong to the family of Adam. He had to be a son of Adam, a child of Adam, to represent Adam's family and offer up his sacrifice on the cross on behalf of Adam's family. And he got that body, he got that human nature, that human flesh through Mary. And Mary could only give it to him if she cooperated freely with God's plan. Her yes, her fiat to the angel Gabriel was true, full and free. And that's why she's essential. Because she had to give that human nature from Adam, but without sin, to the new Adam to represent us on the cross. So, yes, Mary is not central. Jesus is central, but Mary is essential. It is not the Catholic Church who exaggerates the honour that should be given to the humble handmaiden of Nazareth. What the Catholic Church does is simply recognise everything God has done for her, for our sake, for our salvation for the coming of Christ into the world. For it is God who created Mary, sanctified Mary, called Mary, then was born of Mary, then preserved Mary, then assumed Mary, then glorified Mary, and then then crowned Mary. All the Catholic Church does, again, is acknowledge the great things that he who was mighty has done for her. One day we all hope to enter the heavenly temple ourselves, to <coughs> behold the glory presence of God, to witness the ministrations of Christ as the one eternal high priest, and to see the Virgin Mary enthroned as the ark of God in the heavenly holy of holies. God willing, when that day comes, we will see something so marvellous it will make everything you heard tonight seem like straw. Thank you.